Okay, thank you so much for joining us for this YAG seminar on mental health. Um, where all of this started is uh, horrible statistics put forward by the Junior Lawyers Division of the Law Society in its 2017 study. Um, a survey that was really highly concerning where clearly we couldn't ignore the fact that lawyers are not immune to mental health challenges. It found that more than 90% of respondents had experienced stress in their role with 26% of respondents experiencing severe and extreme levels of stress. More than 25% of respondents stated that they had experienced a mental health problem in the last month. So clearly uh, at a very short time before the survey was taken. Um, these figures are, I would say are almost inadmissible, but what do they say? They just say that mental health is a global problem. Lawyers are not immune. And we now have as a community, the arbitration community, we have to look for solutions. And as WIAG, we're you know, a young group of members of this arbitration community. And we thought it was good uh, as our aim to, is to showcase young talents and to enable young practitioners to speak out. When Audley Shepard, Ed Cross and Leon Mulcahy came to us and said, we have this idea for this event. It was a tremendous su success at the London International Disputes Week. Would you be happy to take it on? Uh, we as the WIAG co-chair, so Nathan Searle, Anya George, and Andrei Panov, who won't be there unfortunately today, were super happy to take this on and decide to organize this session. And thanks to our sponsors, uh, Clifford Chance, Fountain Court, and Simmons and Simmons, we have Dr. Mitchell here with us, who will share insights at a more psychological level. So we as lawyers don't necessarily have the keys, but we certainly hope that Dr. Mitchell will help us with that. The aim of this webinar is not overly ambitious. We know that we won't fix the problem today, but we just want first to acknowledge the situation uh, so that we just know where we stand today and give you some tips to work around some of the issues that you could be facing just like we could be facing. Um, and so thanks again for everyone for, for joining us. And we, we've reached 130 participants, which shows uh, how important the topic is today. And I will now leave the floor to Nathan, who will moderate the session with me uh, to introduce the participants and our panelists. Thanks, Flo. Um, it's my privilege uh, now to introduce Dr. Bill Mitchell, uh, a clinical psychologist and author of the acclaimed book, Time to Breathe. And in terms of the format of this session, um, uh, Dr. Bill is going to uh, talk through and, and present uh, on uh, mental health issues from uh, his perspective as a clinical psychologist. And then we're going to uh, follow that with an esteemed panel uh, who I'll introduce uh, after Dr. Mitchell's presentation. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over uh, to Dr. Mitchell, who I believe will now share some slides as well. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you. Um, I work as a clinical psychologist in London. Essentially, I divide my time between seeing people who get referred to me for one-to-one -one work. Um, and I've always had an interest in work-related psychological difficulties. And I also work for a wide variety of organizations, many professional service firms, including law firms, that are genuinely interested in keeping people well. And that is an area that has risen up the uh, agenda of, of many organizations, particularly in the last couple of years. These two areas completely feed one another. Um, many of the people I see in the clinical work I do work in law. In fact, I probably see more lawyers than any other group, actually. Um, and many of them have undoubtedly been robust, resilient people. Um, before some set of circumstances just overwhelmed them. Now that could be work or it could be a combination of their work and their home lives. And in many cases, they have then drifted into a pathway, a very, very slow pathway that gradually takes them closer and closer to ill health, which could be depression or anxiety states, or in many cases, just burning out, the whole energy system collapses. 
Now, my job basically is to get people back on track, um, hopefully with more self-awareness than they had before things went wrong, but also more aware of a handful of things they need to do to keep themselves and their lives in balance. And that is absolutely critical for dealing with a highly pressurizing job. <clears throat> Over the last 18 months, we've all been trying to navigate our way through circumstances we never imagined we would be in. So let me just pause for a moment or two and think about the nature of pressure. And there are really three categories of pressures here. The first are the, pr the pressures which you're all too familiar with in the kind of work you do. At times, short deadlines, difficult people, very stressed people in many occasions, uh, a never ending flow of emails, in many cases, a job that never seems to end. Times when life may be quiet and other times when many matters just hit you at once. Working across time zones, which makes regular sleep uh, something of a challenge change and ambiguity. Um, all of those things are things that just go with the kind of job you do. But in the last 18 months, we've had the pandemic pressures. And there's three things here. We've all been massively disrupted. Our day-to-day -day routines have been turned on their heads and we've all had to create a structure for day-to-day -day life. Some structures work far better than others when it comes to mental well-being. We've been dislocated from friends, colleagues, some people dislocated inside relationships and dislocated from people who could be supportive to us when we really need that help. And we've been living with months of uncertainty. We're not great with uncertainty. I don't think we're wired for uncertainty. I think we're wired for things happening. And I know many, many people who've dealt far more effectively when some bad thing hits them than they've dealt with the uncertainty about whether or not a bad thing might hit them. And that uncertainty is ongoing. So there are the work-related pressures and your home lives and so on, the pandemic pressures. What's the third category? The third category is you. M most of the people I see are hugely pressurizing of themselves. This is far less visible than a difficult client, a tight deadline, or a piece of work that you haven't seen before. Many, many people in your profession are hugely conscientious, they're committed, their sense of responsibility often exceeds what they're able to control. And perfectionism in law is everywhere. Now at its worst, perfectionism is binary. Something is either flawless, or it's an abysmal personal failure. It's like there's nothing in between. And that can drive fears about getting things wrong, fears of failing, fears of letting people down, and so on. Now, under normal circumstances, those internal pressures can contribute to success. But right now, with everything that's going on, many, many people's lives are just very finely balanced. And it might just take one or two additional things to tip that balance. And then you could go into this pathway that could lead into ill health. Now, ultimately, regardless of what pressures there are in your life, what we need is a balancing system that is as strong or stronger than those pressures. Now, we could call this balancing system resilience. We could call it anything. But think about it as a balancing system. When the word resilience comes up, many people think about it as a quality they've got. You'll ask them, you know, how have you got through some of the challenges of the last year? Oh, I'm just a resilient person. That doesn't explain anything. It's a complete circle, but it, it implies it's a quality. Now, I really don't believe resilience is a quality. I think it's a collection of things we've learned to do. I think it's a collection of skills. If you think about them as skills, you would be protective of it, you'd be curious about it, and you'd be very keen to add more skills. And that's what I want to do in this session. In a very, very practical ways, I want to look at some of the key skills that add up to a robust balancing system.
even if the pressures on you are quite considerable. Some self-awareness certainly goes a long way here. And it, I'm always amazed at how little self-awareness people have. I'm just gonna sketch something on this uh, flip chart here. So let's think about this, okay? If this is pressure, right? From very low to very high. And if this is your energy, your effectiveness, and your well-being, okay? Those three things completely interconnect. Lose one and you compromise the others. It's one thing, right? So pressure, very low to very high, energy, effectiveness, and well-being. Now, what is in the middle? And what is in the middle is a curve. Because you didn't join the profession you're in because you want an easy life. You enjoy a challenge. You enjoy being stretched. You don't like every day being exactly the same. If life is too quiet, you can drift down this side of the curve with confidence dropping and maybe anxiety increasing. The good zone is where the demands are just right for our needs. Up there, there's good levels of energy, engagement, connection with what you're doing. Up there, there's spare mental capacity to deal with the unexpected that life just throws at you. Maybe an IT failure, maybe somebody letting you down, maybe not getting information that you need, maybe your kids being sick on an inconvenient day. All of those things need spare mental capacity. Up here, there's a fairly strong confidence system. The voice in the head is on your side. Here, we're busy, but fundamentally, you feel in control of those demands. Now, many of the people I see have been in this zone, give or take, for a long time. Life becomes more demanding and they find themselves nudging down here. An incredibly slow pathway, many months, leading eventually to the zone of ill health. Maybe burning out, maybe anxiety, depression. A recognition of some early red flags here can be hugely protective. How are you sleeping? How's your mood? How irritable are you? Have you withdrawn from people? Is it much harder now to concentrate than it used to be? Is your head filled with self-doubt when normally you'd be fairly up for the challenge of the job? All of those things are early red flags. And look, if you're supervising, managing anybody or working in a team, do look out for some of those red flags in your colleagues. Because in many cases, a helpful conversation here can really help somebody get back into this zone. Now, the way to think about the balancing system is like this. Try and think about a system of skills that's straining to keep you closer to here while the pressures are driving this way, okay? Now, I'm just gonna put a slide up here because I think essentially there are three key building blocks that make up this balancing system. And the idea would be that you try to do something in each building block rather than just doing something in one, okay? So let me go on to screen share and bring up this slide. Okay, <clears throat> three key building blocks, straining to keep you closer to the good place in this curve. The first building block, is about the realization that how we feel, our energy, the stability of our mood, our mental well-being, our effectiveness in really demanding jobs, our happiness sits in a physiological system. Understanding just a little bit about that physiology and then doing a handful of things day to day that keeps that physiology stable will keep us closer to the good place in this car. I'll come back to that. The second building block that really links to it is seeing where choices are day to day. What can you take control of? Now, right now, a part of this is about what is the structure of day to day life? Where are the boundaries that divide the working day from the non working day? What boundaries are there that preserve time for other things in your life that you value? That could include email boundaries, it could include time to protect sleep or family time. It also includes anything that you've learned to do to prevent yourself from becoming overwhelmed when life becomes too busy. 
think about three things here. You're busy. Busy is good. Busy feels in control. You're overloaded. Overloaded is when you've got too much to do, but you're still essentially in control. Overwhelmed is when you've lost control. And that's why the reaction to it is so emotional. Um, so what are the levers to reassert control when life becomes too busy? Now linked to all of this are the things you do in your head, the way we see things, our attitudes and our mindsets. Some mindsets go directly to mental well-being, and some mindsets undermine us. We have mental habits as well as physical habits. We're not aware of those mental habits. They lie just below the level of awareness, but they drive emotions like guilt, like anxiety. They undermine our confidence. If we could pull some of those mental habits into consciousness and actively challenge them, then there's a raft of things we can do here to help preserve our psychological well-being and also our effectiveness. So those three things interconnect to create your system. A quick word about the physiology. There are certain biochemical processes that underpin our energy and well-being. Cortisol is one. Cortisol is a major driver of energy. But when life becomes uncertain, or if the demands become overwhelming, stress increases, cortisol rises. It gives us artificial short-term energy. That can really mess up sleep. That makes us feel anxious and agitated. It interferes with our mood and makes decision-making difficult. We also have chemicals in our central nervous system that regulate mood and are essential for critical thinking, essential for memory and creativity, natural antidepressants. Now, those biochemicals keep us closer to the good place of this car. When they go off balance, we find ourselves wandering down here. There's a handful of things keep this stable. What I've done is I've put the key stabilizers into the form of a quick assessment device that you could use to see just what you're doing currently to keep the physiology of this in a good state of equilibrium. I'll just go through this briefly with you, okay? So these are the key stabilizers. Now, <clears throat> right now, with all the disruption and uncertainty that it is, it is very useful indeed to be doing something that is physically active most days. I'm not talking about an hour in the gym or a 20 mile bike ride. I could be talking about a 25 minute brisk walk. That's great at the start of the day to energize you for the day, but it also helps you decompress at the end of the day and it can help you close the working day from the non-working day. If you're doing some physical activity, most days give yourself a plus two here. If it's weekends only or a few times a month, a plus one. And if it's drifted away, as it has for many people, a minus one. We need ways of winding down. I mean, this, the job you're in is highly intense. And it, there's times when it can be very pressurizing. Being able to let go of that pressure quite quickly can be a huge advantage. Now, some people, of course, use yoga, Pilates, meditation, and so on, which is very, very helpful. Other people, just get that same release of tension through day-to-day -day habits like cooking um, or reading a novel before bed or listening to music without doing anything else at the same time. Anything you do where your head is just absorbed in it, you're not rushing it, can give you the same degree of physiological um, relaxation. I wouldn't include television, just like I wouldn't include computer games or, or riding a motorbike. Those things are all distractions rather than relaxants, okay? If you're doing something I'm suggesting, most days, give yourselves a plus two here. A few times a month or weekends, a plus one, and if they've all disappeared, a minus one. Sleep's critical to all of this. Sleep's critical to your immune system. Sleep's critical to critical thinking. It's, cr it's critical for maintaining good levels of emotional equilibrium. If we don't get enough sleep, we're more liable to get depressed and anxious. How much do we need? Well, about seven hours, actually. Seven hours or more. If that's what you are getting, give yourselves a plus two. If it's six and a half to seven, a plus one. And if it's less than six, a minus one. Even your diet has an impact on this. There's such a thing as an antidepressive diet. 
basically, um, I'm urging you to think about a balance of protein to carbohydrate that stabilizes blood sugar. Um, that sort of diet, which in the mornings would be eggs or low sugar muesli and plain yogurt, rather than toast and jam or cornflakes, uh, stabilizes mental energy and mental effectiveness. Similarly, protein relative to carbohydrate at lunchtime, so that wouldn't be a sandwich, a bag of crisps and a Coca-Cola, uh, will give you a more effective, more decisive afternoon. Snacking on fruit or protein rather than a chocolate bar or a cake. So think about your diet from that point of view, rating yourself from plus two to minus one, okay? Alcohol, as you can imagine, isn't great for mental well-being. Um, over 24 hours, alcohol acts as a depressant, um, reducing mental energy and our effectiveness. Think about how much you're drinking in the average week. If it's more than about two bottles of wine a week, minus one. If it's more than three bottles, a minus two. Less than that is zero, okay? Now, the people in our lives have a huge impact on this. And they have that impact physiologically. And of course, we've been dislocated for months. Friends give us support, acceptance, warmth. Friends jog us out of a bad mood, which is an advantage of working in an office. And of course, friends make us laugh. And there's evidence that laughter is as powerful as exercise when it comes to stabilizing the physiology of mental health. So if you're still connecting with good people on a regular basis, people who lighten the load, give yourselves a plus two, and if it's more like a few times a month, a plus one. The key relationship in your life is also hugely influential here. It's one of the pillars of underpinning our resilience. Over the last 18 months, many relationships have just strained a bit, fault lines have opened up, other relationships have really done well. Relationships need time. Where do you and your partner get time just to connect? If you, That needs boundaries. Now that could be around breakfast time or breaking off at lunchtime. And that could be a couple of evenings a week where you just finish early enough to connect without looking at emails, without working. If you're doing that regularly, a few times a week, a plus two, less frequently a plus one. Okay, now that's a very brief overview of a handful of things that help to stabilize the physiology of our mental well-being. Think about your scores. I'm looking for a moderate positive score, plus four, plus six, okay? I'm urging you to think about one or two that you just know matter. They make a difference. Some people know if they don't exercise for a week or more, they're just off their game. They're more irritable, they're less decisive, their mood drops. So they anchor it. It's not negotiable. I think we need a couple of these things as non-negotiables because the natural tendency for committed, conscientious, perfectionistic people when life gets more demanding is to give more and more to the demands and just cut back on everything that makes up balance. Now that creates a profound imbalance that can take us down this curve. Right now, you could have a score of plus six. You could be picking up a bunch of files for a very difficult matter. Within three weeks, your plus six could have become a minus six, simply by giving no thought to this. But that change in scores will be reflected in a change in your mood, your effectiveness, perhaps your ability to sleep and your anxiety levels. Try to use this as a tool to help you navigate. And that takes us to the second building block in all this, which is around making some choices, taking control of some things, and ultimately to the way we see things. Now, I'll just come off this and uh, come back in the room. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, working from home, maybe part-time working in an office. Uh, what's, the, what's the balance right now? Is it working for you? What's your day looking like? When you get out of bed, how long does it take you to start working? For many, many people, it takes them approximately 30 seconds from getting out of bed to start working, right into the emails. Is this really the best way to start your day? 
What about just having a space where you use some time to energize yourself, maybe part of the balance to prepare you for the working day? How do you define the closure to the working day? Let me give you an example here. This is somebody who works in a profession like yours, Mike. Mike starts work at 7.30 in the morning and he rarely finishes before 7.30 at night when he connects with his kids. He has a 15 minute break in the middle of the day to have a sandwich. After he's had supper, he typically works for another one to two hours catching up on stuff. And he does emails all the way through to switching the light off before he, before he goes to sleep, okay? Mike is not sleeping well. Mike is much more anxious than he's ever been. Mike is in a highly stressed state. Could Mike make some better choices? Well, here's a few examples. Maybe he could define his day more tightly. Maybe an 11 hour day rather than a 14 hour day. Maybe even a 10 hour day. Maybe he could make better decisions about working in the evening or not. Here's a question worth thinking about. Is there anything that if I don't do it tonight, there will be a bad consequence tomorrow morning? If the question isn't, is there something that I could do tonight? Because there's something every night there. Is there something that if I don't do it, there could be a bad consequence? Priorities is about consequences. And some nights that could give you an evening off. He could maybe have an email boundary maybe an hour, hour and a half before he goes to bed to give him better sleep. Maybe he could have longer breaks. Maybe he could build some activity in. And maybe the best time for him to go for a run might be around lunchtime. Try to build some flexibility. Try to make some real choices about how you segment day and take control of the day. Why do people not make those choices? Sometimes it's because they don't realize they can make the choices. And sometimes it's because they don't realize the power of those choices. And very often it's because they don't give themselves the permission to make the choices. And that's something I'll come back to. Taking control when life becomes overwhelming. I've seen a lot of that over the last year. I'll just give you a brief example. This is a woman called Carla who works actually in finance. Uh, two kids um, living in a flat, um, homeschooling for a period of time. The um, school expecting her to do five hours a day of homeschooling on top of a full-time job. Checking in on elderly relatives, um, starting work again after the kids are in bed, working through to midnight, becoming absolutely exhausted. Worse than that, feeling she was failing, failing everybody. The kids, her work, relatives she wasn't able to check in on, and so on. Perfectionism turned to self-blame. Nudging down this curve towards depression or burning out. Now, Carla did a few things that I would recommend you to think about that just turned this around. Firstly, she moved from perfectionism to pragmatism. Pragmatism is a useful mindset. How much time can I give to the homeschooling? Well, maybe two hours, not five. What's the best use of two hours? That's pragmatic thinking. What does this person need to read in this email? Maybe three points. I'll give them three points, not five pages of detail. <clears throat> Pragmatism can allow you to cut through what really needs to be done. Secondly, she went to tough prioritizing in the average day. She, she was getting overwhelmed by the length of the list. But what things on this list really matter today? And that could be a smaller number. What are the things if I don't do them, there could be a problem today. She started marking out time free from interruptions to get key things done. She became much more discriminating about which, what, um, meetings she attended and which she turned down. She did emails in blocks rather than as they come in. Now those are emergency measures. I'm not urging you to make that your way of working, but think about emergency measures when life becomes overwhelming. <clears throat> she started blocking out time in her diary in advance of things she was committed to. 
she had a very helpful conversation with a boss. Now, a boss actually wasn't the most empathic of people, but he was practical and he was flexible. And together they worked out which priorities really mattered. Together they negotiated some deadlines and he really encouraged her to take some time for herself so as not to end up a casualty of those overwhelming circumstances. That conversation was pivotal in helping her to give herself permission to reintroduce some boundaries. She reintroduced the nine o'clock line. Nine o'clock, there's still loads more I could do at work or at home, but it's now my time. Time for a bath, time for a Netflix movie, time to read a novel. She got to bed around 11 rather than 12.30. She got up earlier. In getting up earlier, she brought yoga back, which she'd always done and enjoyed, but it disappeared. Just in those moods, she got to a plus four on that questionnaire. And she started to feel more energized and more in control. And the last thing she did was more of a mindset piece. She realized that our perfectionistic approach to life was really working against her. So she started to find a voice of greater self-kindness. Now, this is something that quite a number of people have talked to me about over the last 18 months. They realize the circumstances they're in can be overwhelming. And just finding a voice of kindness to oneself rather than self-criticism and self-blame can be hugely helpful. And many people are also finding that voice for their colleagues and sometimes for their kids, which can be hugely helpful. Now, those are all things about balance, structure, boundaries, and finding balance. What's balance? Balance is not about a nine to five job. Balance is about thinking about what do you really value in your life outside of work? What do you not want to lose? And then trying to find some slots day to day that gives you some time to reinforce those areas. If what you don't want to lose is being an engaged parent or having a good relationship or being a good friend or being fit or being just an interesting person, what are you doing just day to day to reinforce some of those things? One hour a day could reinforce one of them, which over a week could keep you in some sort of balance. Don't think about balance as things we do on holidays. Try not to think about it as things we only do at weekends. Think about something every day that's in the balance. Now, this takes us to the mindset piece because mindset is absolutely critical for our effectiveness and how we approach demanding jobs and so on. And actually, earlier on this afternoon, I saw a lawyer um, who I've been seeing for a while, it was a follow-up with him. And um, he's had a difficult road in life and there have been times when he's had periods of acute anxiety um, and he struggled. But over the last year or so, he's been doing really well and he's been following many of the things that I'm talking about here. And uh, we were just looking this afternoon at some of the things he's doing in, in a very demanding job, uh, in a job actually quite similar to yours, um, and um, at times when it, it appears to be very unstructured and unpredictable. He goes for day-to-day -day structure. Um, he does a handful of things uh, that helps to maintain the physiology of well-being, exercising most days, trying to preserve sleep, not drinking. Drink could be a problem to him in the past as a way of uh, decompressing. He's cut alcohol out completely. Um, so there are, there's a priority on preserving the, the, the energy system here. He's managing his work more tightly than he was before with much better clarity about what the priorities are. And he's delegating more effectively to people who are available to him. He's putting more thought into planning, clear about what he doesn't need to do, not doing emails every 30 seconds, but roughly every half hour. <clears throat> clearer about what he needs to do on any day. That's helping a lot. Um, 
there's a mindset piece around here because he knows he's good at what he does. And he has a sense of purpose in what he does. Now, finding purpose in what you do goes directly to mental well-being. And in your jobs, your skills are highly relevant to many, many people. Many people depend on your skills. Um, in many cases, you help people sleep at night. Seeing the relevance of what you do, rather than letting your head go to futility, is a huge boost to our mental well-being as is our perception of controllability. Sometimes just seeing what you can control, things that are credible, is enough to bring stress down without even needing to exercise those choices. Seeing controllability rather than letting your head go to helplessness. Um, the other thing he's doing is he's being just more honest with people than he's ever been. There are times when he finds life just gets a bit too much and he's honest with his team. He's honest with his colleagues and he finds that that works very, very well. He finds it through honesty and openness. He's able to get the support, which is sometimes just verbal support uh, that he didn't get in the past when he was caught up in attitudes about protecting his ego and appearing to be strong and not letting other people see when you've got some vulnerabilities. That's helping him a great deal in getting good support. And finally, he's carving out time for himself. This is not easy when you're in the kind of job you're in because guilt is a huge headwind on everything that I'm talking about. You can feel guilty if you go to bed early you can feel guilty if you switch your emails off at nine o'clock rather than half past 11. You can feel guilty if you go for a run at lunchtime, although it might be the best time for you to do it. Guilt makes this all difficult. Now look, <clears throat> guilt is an oppositional mindset. And the voice of guilt could be very, very loud at any time that you're not giving time to the demands that you see are on you, the inextinguishable list. There's another way of viewing this. And that is for you to be able to sustain the energy and the well-being that you need to be effective in the kind of job you do. You need to invest some time in taking care of yourself and your energy. This is not about either or. This is about integrating what I'm talking about in small ways to make this way of life sustainable. <clears throat> it's about integrating this in order to stay at the good zone of this curve rather than giving everything to the demands and cutting these back, having no protective system and nudging down this curve into ineffectiveness and fatigue. So that is a very brief overview of uh, the approach that I, I take. Hopefully there's some tips here for you. Happy to take questions, um, which will be filtered through um, uh, um, one of you. And um, happy to take questions. And um, hopefully this is practical and helpful. <clears throat> Uh, thanks so so much, Dr. Mitchell. Um, so far, uh, we haven't had um, any questions from the floor, but if you do have questions, if you could use the Q and A function at the uh, at the bottom of the Zoom and um, send those through. Um, I guess uh, if we haven't got questions from the floor, I one question. Um, uh, uh, I had um, from from what was a very interesting um, and an, an insightful um, uh, presentation was you know controllability and I think particularly uh, as a more junior lawyer um, we we do feel that where um, yeah uh, it can be hard to switch off because we don't want to miss something 
you know, if the partner is, um, you know, emailing us at 11 o'clock at night, we don't pick up till the next morning. I mean, is there, um, you know, in, in a sense, we're all, when clients who might be in a different time zone are, are doing the same thing, is, what would be your advice to someone in, in, in that position? Is there, you know, is that in the too hard bus or is there steps? Yeah, that they, yeah they, absolutely. <clears throat> Look, you, you could have a client right now on uh, the west coast of the US, right? Um, and things are really heating up on, the, on, on that matter. Look, it's highly probable you will be getting emails probably through to 11 or later, okay? Now, try to make your day flexible so that you get some time just to build some balance in. Now, that could be a couple of hours around 12 o'clock to two o'clock it could be starting later next morning um try not to run in u.s time and uk time okay that would be the tip if you're involved with a u.s client maybe move to u.s time allowing yourself some balance when the u.s cl client is asleep which could be your morning uh, that could be family time. It could be exercise time uh, to try to balance it. Be as flexible as you can be. Now, if you've got a partner you're reporting to who doesn't buy into this idea of flexibility, then that is definitely a bigger challenge. In which case, I would really urge you to have a conversation about this. I think one of the things that have come out of the pandemic is a better appreciation that the circumstances have been potentially highly stressful for people. And I think people need to be more open, more honest about how things have been affecting them. So if you're getting exhausted by emails, conference calls at midnight, you need that balance earlier in the morning, have a conversation about this. Um, and you may well find that opens a door to greater flexibility. Try not to have an Australian client and a US client <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, the questions are coming thick and fast. Uh, okay. So I'm going to pose one more and then hand over to, to Flo. Um, so the the next question was are there any tips to improve the quality of sleep sometimes even if we do get the, the seven hours of sleep we don't feel like we're really rested the next morning um yeah a few quick tips there um try to do something that helps you wind down before going to bed that could be listening to music could be reading a novel could be having a relaxing bath actually that helps sleep um, have an email boundary uh, sometime before you go to bed. I'd recommend at least an hour. Um, many people wake in the night and then have difficulty getting back to sleep. The head rather agitated. Um, you can then get into a mindset of frustration. Okay, why can't I sleep? I've got an important meeting tomorrow. I've only had four hours sleep. I won't be able to function in that meeting. I've got to get to sleep. All right, that's the frustration pathway, and that will definitely keep you awake. Try to switch to the acceptance pathway, okay? I've had four hours sleep, I will get by on four hours sleep. You can drive jumbo jets on four hours sleep. You can do brain surgery on four hours sleep. You're in the bed, there are no demands on you. Just try and relax into the bed. Maybe do some slow breathing exercises, perhaps with some relaxing imagery, trying to get yourself away from work-related thoughts, and the chances are you'll get back to sleep. Condition an exercise like this. So you do it every time you wake, and you'll find you're getting back to sleep much more quickly. I've done this for years, actually, and because um, I'm quite a broken sleeper, and I get back to sleep very quickly doing an exercise like this, uh, which can be very, very helpful. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, we have a lot of questions. It's almost slightly <laughs> overwhelming. Um, just a big one. I mean, they're all good questions and they all deserve to be addressed and hopefully we'll address them in the course of the panel as well. That, that's one personally 
hit me as really relevant is that introducing exercise, healthy eating, etc., can feel like adding more stuff on your to-do list. Uh, and, and so how do you deal with that? Because it can, I mean, the better a behavior can create the overwhelm itself. Yeah, absolutely. And um, look, that's why we're talking about three building blocks here rather than just three things. If you think three things, you'll think exercise, um, time to prepare good food, uh, time for yoga. Wow, I don't have time for any of this. OK, <clears throat> so you've then got to go to the next building block. How can I create the time for this? Where are the potential slots? Where is the potential flexibility? When would be the best time for me to do it? And like I say, it could be around lunchtime, perhaps, rather than 10 o'clock at night. Um, and how much do I need to do? You know, 20 minutes could be enough. It doesn't need to be getting across to a gym and working out for an hour there. Um, so think about what you need to do. Think about how you're going to do it, where the available slots are. And then you need to go to the permission mindset. Because the mindset that's being expressed in that question is the non-permission mindset. It's basically, I don't have time to do this, but I've got to do it. And I'm going to feel guilty if I don't do it, but I can't do it. That's the mindset you're in. So that needs to shift to, for me to be at my best, I've got to find the time for this. Now, look, you could be about to do an opening speech for some key matter, let's say. Or you could be about to do a pitch for a potential new client. What sort of state do you want to be in for that pitch? If you've had three hours sleep broken uh, because you've been up preparing till four in the morning, if you've had a bad breakfast and too many coffees, you'll walk into that pitch and no matter how good the presentation is, it's not going to come across well. You could lose a pitch just by being in the wrong mental place. If you want to do a really good pitch, give some thought to some of the things I'm talking about. Try to get seven hours sleep, try and have a run, maybe the night before or the morning of the presentation. Maybe go for a walk and rehearse it in your head. Imagine it going really well. Do the, do the mental preparation as well as the physical preparation. And then you'll see that what we're doing is not just an add-on to a list, but something that is an advantage for you to be at your best in this job. Um, one uh, theme that, that's uh, come up in the questions as well is, um, and it comes from what you touched on about being perfectionist, is, is receiving feedback or receiving you know, difficult uh, news or constructive feedback on our, um, our, our work. You know, how, you know, what's your advice in, in terms of, of, of dealing with that and not getting into that spiral of, um, uh, of, you know, of perfectionism and uh, particularly dealing with um, uh, yeah, constructive feedback? Yeah. Um... Uh, I'll just use this for a second. As I was saying earlier, you know, um, perf perfectionism is binary. If something isn't excellent, it's a failure. Okay. So feedback, um, pointing out a few things you haven't done well, maybe a couple of points you didn't take into account would be perceived as letting yourself or others down. The idea is to try to open that space. So, okay. So this is flawless, right? And this is fail. Now, what is in the middle, okay? And what is in the middle is the learning zone. Life would be incredibly boring if we were so perfect that we could never learn. So try and see feedback as here. And the goal is to help you to get to there. <clears throat> Try and see feedback as an opportunity to grow rather than um, a, a statement about how you're not good enough. Now, this is something I have conversations with people at all levels in their careers. I know very experienced QCs where I have conversations about this. Um, so 
if you can tackle it at an early point in your career, um, you'll be able to deal with it much more robustly when it comes to your career becoming more stable. Um, sorry, there's a car outside with some uh, loud rap music going past, just temporarily distracting me. Um, so if we can tackle some of these mental habits at an early point, uh, it'll make life easier for you in the future. <clears throat> but that would be the tip. See it as learning. Think um, about how boring it would be if we were perfect. I think <clears throat> the final question for me, but I don't know if Shaw has another before we move to our panel, is um, we're in this era of remote working, yeah, and if you're working at home and yeah, the work being thrown at you is all very urgent. Um, um, for use in arbitration. Yeah, are there any tips on how to disconnect from from work? Um, yeah, and when when the work in the home space, you know, yeah. is the same. Yeah, exactly. And this came up a lot in conversations over the last eighteen months. In fact, some people have told me they miss the commute because the commute helps them to divide work from non-work. So the tip would be introduce the equivalent of the commute. Get to the end of your working day and maybe go for a good half hour walk as a way of decompressing. Um, something I do myself, uh, change your clothes. Um, even though I'm working right now at home on Zoom, I've got a reasonably smart shirt on. Uh, I do that every day rather than being a t-shirt and you know at the end of the day I'll then change out of this into some casual clothes like I used to do when I went into an office and this just helps to demarcate work from non-work. I had another thought actually on, the, on a previous question this is very briefly I'd like to uh, say and this came out of a talk similar to this that I gave to a group of barristers uh, pre-pandemic um, and an experienced QC came up to me at the end and he said, you know, you've given me a lot of tips and made me think about the way I work and all the rest of it. And he said, you know, I, re I realize that sometimes working till three in the morning and so on before an opening speech isn't really good. So I'm going to try and do more in the way of protecting sleep and, and some activity. And then he said, you know, you've positioned this as the need to give yourself permission to do this. I would put it differently, he said. I would position this as I have a duty to do what you're saying in order for me to be at my best for my clients. Now, I thought that was a fantastic point. And he just said, you know, getting to bed at three in the morning, getting up in the morning, tired to go into court. I'm not at my best. So he positioned it as duty as a highly responsible professional rather than permission, which I thought was a fantastic point. <clears throat> Thank you, just maybe one last question, Bill, and then we'll move to the panel because time is running, unfortunately, because it's so fa fascinating. Um, if you identify that you have a team member who's not at a reasonable score on your, on your score list, what can you do? Um, I think, yeah, I like to address that in two ways, actually. You might have a team member who you see has just nudged into this curve. So they become more maybe withdrawn, less decisive. Maybe they're making mistakes they wouldn't normally make. Maybe there's areas of irritability coming through. Or maybe just uh, their emails have a tone to them that's making you a bit concerned. Um, look, what I urge you to do uh, would be to say something along the lines of, look, we've worked together for some months. I think I know you pretty well. Um, you just don't seem your usual self to me lately. Do you, would you like a cup of coffee? Would you like an opportunity to chat things through? Um, you could add to that by saying, look, the last 18 months has been pretty awful for all of us. And there's certainly been times when I felt really overwhelmed. There have been times I haven't been able to sleep. There have been times I've been much more anxious than usual. Um, and uh, I know I know what it feels like. I mean, how, how has it been for you? And you're here presenting yourself as a model of somebody who's kind of experienced some of the same things. Um, and that can lead into a conversation about some of the things that you do to help to balance your, your life. 
Now that then could move to the uh, scores on the questionnaire, for example. And you know, you can bring in um, some of the language I'm using to make this easier to talk about. Um, I mean, some people, you know, who know this kind of stuff that I talk about say, you know, where are you on Bill's curve? Now that's just a very, very easy way of helping people to say, well, I'm not there, I'm probably here. <clears throat> easy language. Similarly, you know, what kind of things have you got as non-negotiable? Are you still holding on to those? Makes it easier for people to talk about conscious decisions about balance. Keep the language simple. <clears throat> well, thank you, Bill, for this insight. Um, maybe we can move on now to the panel. You're most welcome to stay. Yes, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and, and we'll see our perspectives that are of course, much less worked through than yours, but we've got a, a top-notch panel that Nathan will now introduce. Thank you. Um, so it's my pleasure uh, to welcome um, uh, Ed Cross, Audley Shepherd QC, Leanne Mulcahy QC, and Anya George. Um, uh, I might just briefly ask the panel first just to introduce them so themselves for those who uh, don't already know them. So perhaps Ed, if you could just say a couple of words. So I'm, I'm Ed Cross, the one waving. I'm a disputes lawyer in London, although actually I now live in Bristol, a lifestyle choice, but um, remote working makes that irrelevant. Um, I've been practicing for about 25 years, used to work with Audley at one point, but I won't be rude about that experience and <laughs> pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, Leanne, uh, can you briefly introduce yourself? Yes, uh, I'm Leanne. I'm a uh, QC at Fountain Court Chambers. I've been in practice now for some 28 years, the last 12 as a silk. Um, I also sit as a deputy high court judge and as an arbitrator, and I spend about a quarter of my year sitting. So I see it on both sides of the, the bench or the arbitration table. Uh, and, and Audley. Hi everyone um, and thank you for tuning in to this uh, webinar. hope you found it useful. Um, I've known Bill from before for things he's done at, uh, at my firm and, and uh, it's so useful every time I hear him. I'm a partner at Clifford Chance, been here for 35 years uh, and uh, also uh, chair of the board of the LCIA. And Anya. Um, I'm a partner in uh, the international arbitration practice at Schoenberg Lickner in Zurich. Uh, I'm dual qualified in Switzerland and in England and Wales. I've been in practice for slightly less long than my distinguished co-panelists. Um, and I'm really looking forward to uh, discussing maybe some of the slightly more junior perspectives of this issue. Um, but I'm sure that uh, everyone will be able to provide uh, really good insight and personal experience on this topic. Great. And now uh, over to Flo for the, the first question. Yes, yeah, so my, my first question is directed to Leanne. Um, of course, international arbitration, as its name suggests, is international. So it involves international parties across different time zones and business cultures. When do you think it's acceptable or not to be scheduling conference calls? Because our experience is that the window for acceptable times for scheduling such calls has broadened with remote working. Yes, I suspect that's true of most people's experience. Um, I think the boundaries generally um, between work and personal life have blurred enormously. Um, I mean, it's partly technology and the expectation to be available 24-7 and responding to things 24-7, which I, th I think we react to and, and then start doing, and it becomes more of a, a norm or a habit. But it's also the pandemic, I think, because everybody's at home and has been at home and hasn't been able to, to, to necessarily go anywhere. Um, I, I think work has just expanded as well. And um, I think the difficulty in terms of scheduling um, calls is that you do need to involve the arbitrators as well, as I think one of the participants identified. It's, but, you know, I think there, it is important to, to start getting a consensus um, that unless it's absolutely necessary because you're working from one end of the world to another across multiple time zones, that, that you know, early mornings and late evenings are not appropriate times to be scheduling hearings and, and 
and calls if, um, if you know, as I said, unless it absolutely can't be avoided. Um, but I think it's a matter of bringing in arbitrators as well on that discussion. Um, and maybe the parties can try to get together and agree what would be suitable timings and then present that to the tribunal. But it, it's just getting recognition. I think that we need to recompartmentalize. Um, we need to start reestablishing those boundaries. And as, 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 uh, Bill, Dr. Bill was saying, you, you, we, we need to start establishing times when we're not looking at screens, and we're not looking at email, and we're not responding, and just get back into that mindset. I mean, I remember the days before mobile phones and emails, and, you know, there would be a time at which you could stop working, and nobody was expecting you to be responding. And I think somehow we've got to try and find ways to get back to, you know, not looking at emails every evening, um, not looking at them first thing in the morning, having holidays where we get away from the demands and expectations for a while. Um, and, and part of this, I think, is just with arbitration, which unlike litigation doesn't have fixed hours and 4 p.m. deadlines and court vacations, you know, trying to reintroduce that sort of culture. Do you have any concrete tips, Leanne, that you'd like to share with us? And I will pose the question to the other panelists as well. So you... <laughs> I, I think it's a matter of just re-educating, um, and I think it, it's everybody becoming more mindful, I think, of the demands that, that we have, um, and just trying to, I, it's very difficult, I think, but it's having conversations like this, it, it's, it, and it's trying to ensure that they're not just at junior level, <laughs> but they're also at senior level, because the people who tend to set those deadlines are often, as, as I said, the, the, arbitra the arbitral tribunal, or the sole arbitrator, if you've got a sole arbitrator. So I think you've got to bring them into this as well. But I'll hand over to my colleagues, who I'm sure will yeah. also have ideas. <laughs> can can I refer? Anya? Oh, sorry. Go on, Anya. No, no. Yeah, maybe Anya can start, and then and then Audley take the lead. Oh, I'm perfectly happy for Audley to start. But no, I mean, I think uh, what Leanne said is very true, and I think it's we often look to sort of concrete measures when I think it is about the mindset, and I think it is about each individual really realizing that they are allowed to set boundaries and that they should communicate those and that we are creating um, a space where that can be discussed because I think that's often the concern, you know, it's easy for us to say set boundaries. It's easy as me as a partner to block time in my calendar and to say, I don't want to be disturbed during that time. It's much less easy, of course, for someone more junior to do that, but it's not impossible. And I, I think that's where we have to start is saying, you know, we recognize that and within a team, we, we do create a dialogue where people feel comfortable saying, I have this limitation, I have these other demands on my time. And, and that's not a sign of weakness, it's not a sign of lack of commitment, and something that I, I can communicate at work. So that, that is my practical tip. Audley, what, what did you want to share with us? I, was, I wanted to share the elephant in the room. Uh, and the elephant in the room is that we are in a service industry. And I'm sure in all our firms and our chambers, we say the priority is the client. And uh, you may be familiar with what is it that clients look for in their legal advisors, and it's the, the three A's. It's ability, it's affability, they want to get on with us, but the third one is availability. And I think that puts huge pressure on us. Uh, I know some in-house counsel that go to bed every night with the phone under their pillows because they think they may be woken by the chief executive. Now, I think most of us are not uh, in that situation, uh, but I think it makes it quite difficult because as a partner, if you think you're not responsive enough to a client, another firm will be instructed. As uh, an associate, uh, I'm sure you think if you're not responsive enough to the partner, then that work or the next piece of good work will go to somebody else who's more responsive. And, and it's balancing. And that's why we have to embrace these issues where we can speak up and uh, to set boundaries. Um, I'm very bad. I, if a thought comes to my head, I'll send an email. I don't necessarily expect a response, but if it happens to be, on a Saturday morning, it's just when the thoughts come into my head and, and I'll put it down in email because I don't want to wait till Sunday evening or Monday morning before I, but that is putting pressure on other people. Certainly one thing we've talked about is do we have a no email 
Sunday or a no email weekend or a no email after eight o'clock at night um, can be done, can't be done the day before a hearing. Um, but it's those sort of boundaries and those sorts of discussions that, that really do need to take place. Communication with, with your team is so important. And Ed, do you want to share some tips with us? Yeah, I really um, echo what Audley says. I mean, I, th I think the responsibility is very much on the partner to set the boundaries in discussion with your team. You know, certainly in my team, we, we talk about the, what we're going to do if when people are on holiday and, and really reinforce that I don't want to be disturbed on holiday. If they need to get me, they, they can give me a call or send me a text, but I won't be looking at my emails and I don't expect them to do the same. I think you know it's it's incumbent on the partner to um, stand up to a tribunal if they if they're um, putting a deadline down that sort of ignores a holiday period or weekends or you know uh, personal commitments that people have. Um, I had one example where we've been waiting quite a long time for an award, and everybody knows as a lawyer you, you get very anxious when you're waiting for a big decision. The clients are anxious, you're anxious, and you're you don't you know there isn't always visibility about when it's going to happen. And I could see it approaching the summer holiday period and people were going to be away. So I wrote to the tribunal and I said, look, um, it's been a very difficult 18 months and uh, my team need to take time out. Um, if you were thinking of handing down your award in August, could we perhaps discuss that so that I can manage, you know, the resources at my end, which was code for don't you dare, because my, my, my team are going to be on holiday and they need a break. And actually, to the, the tribunal's credit, they came back and said, absolutely, no, they need downtime. This is our timeline. Does that work? And I think it's just it, it's not about being weak. It's not about, um, uh, you know, admitting to the other side that your team need a break. It's about being mindful and pushing back. And, and I think the, the more senior people need to do that. Thanks, Ed. I think it's true. Everyone needs a break from time to time. Um, so, so that uh, segues nicely into our, our next question, um, you know, which is the issue of um, you know, holiday periods and being conscious of cultural differences. So, you know, there's Christmas and New Year uh, in Europe. There's there's summer vacation um, it, you know, in in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere, but the different times of year. Uh, and you've got other uh, you know, holiday periods. Eid is, a, is, is, an, is an example. Um, so, uh, Anya, uh, what's your view? To what extent should lawyers and parties be and tribunals be taking this into account um, when, when preparing timetables? Uh, you know, should there be more understanding around lengths of time or should we be you know, insisting you know, very much on the... Uh, yeah, you know, that equal time to to, to each party, um, even if that means that one party has to work through uh, all their holidays. Well, I think it, it goes a little bit, you know, to balance again. I think it's um, in international arbitration, you're you're nearly always going to run across this situation where it, whether it's team members, clients, or the, or the arbitrators coming from different cultural backgrounds with different uh, demands on, you know, or different holidays to, to contend with. And of course, it's not always going to be possible to, to juggle all of that. Um, you know, at the risk of repeating what was just said, I think it really is about, first of all, everyone involved um, clearly stating what, what those requirements are, which is something that still certainly more junior members of the team wouldn't do. Um, which is maybe a first point uh, if we're talking about, you know, cultural diversity within a team um, and you're, you're, you know, you're sitting in London, you might not necessarily flag that you've got an important religious holiday coming up uh, that's from a different culture. So I think it's first of all that the participants uh, flag those points and then as to the question, should we be more mindful and, and maybe be more generous, you know, with, with opposing parties? Um, this may be a bit of a continental perspective. I do feel that it's something that, that is brought up and, and dealt with. And I would say, certainly, again, if we're dealing with Western participants that, you know, do have some periods that are, that are considered downtime, um, so between Christmas and New Year, and where we would, as a rule, grant more time to the other side, we would recognise that as a time that that we really just don't expect them to be working. And if we give them a week more, then they probably won't be working. 
Um, and I think then, you know, of course, it may be that you're you're giving a bit of an advantage. Um, is that a fair trade off? I think where if we're talking about giving a whole extra month, um, maybe to parties in France who you know who, who have a real sort of stop between uh, July and August, that's not something we tend to do. But then, yeah, circling back, I think it really is something we do need to um, to consider. It's something that, in my experience, we, we do we do consider if we can. Uh, and Ed, I know we've, we've talked about vacation periods as well, but um, yeah, and I know that Leanne's already mentioned that you know, in arbitration, should we be looking to instill you know, some, some, uh, some, some periods of downtime like, like the courts do with court vacations, um, uh, you know, in order to ensure that we're, we're not working you know, our teams you know, 365 days a year. I don't know if you have a perspective. Yeah, on I mean, I, I'd endorse what, what Anya says. I, I think you've got to try, haven't you? I mean, the, the reality is, is the real problem is that arbitration obviously can sit over the summer. So during the pandemic, my trial for five weeks in March went to the August period, bang, straight through holidays, um, school holidays. That's a disaster. Um, and it's really tough for the team. Uh, it was tough for my family as well. And sometimes you just can't control that. That was an extraordinary example. But being um, mindful about it, speaking to the other side and saying, let's do something that's sensible and works here, being prepared to say it to the tribunal is, is really important. Um, but there's no question there's a real challenge there um, because you're, you've got the problem of the tribunal's availability, which could be really constrained. And actually, that's what often will dictate when hearings take place, isn't it? Thank you so much. Um, oddly, we wondered if you could share your perspective as an arbitrator on these issues. Yes, I mean, certainly. And, and um, this session is going to be mainly about being part of the, the council team and whatnot. But I, I wanted to say something about being an arbitrator and especially getting one's first appointments. Um, I, I sometimes joke that um, uh, if I'm f feeling mischievous, I'll, I'll say that I'm missing a page in my bundle and you can see the most junior person of the team then run off in a blind panic to try to find a replacement page and, and just come, as soon as they come back, say, oh, I think I've just found it, sorry. Um, but I don't do that, uh, I hope, uh, to add stress to the team. Um, but what I wanted to say something about, like me, I expect when you get your first appointments, you get them from the institutions. Uh, and they may be small value, um, but often as a sole arbitrator, uh, I had a number where, where the respondent wouldn't participate. And that was new to me because that didn't happen in my experience as, as, as counsel. Uh, and that is an aspect of your practice that is also very stressful. Being an arbitrator is stressful and uh, it's something for you to consider in, uh, if you're in that position. I don't think it's as stressful as being an advocate, but there is pressure to keep control of the proceedings. There is pressure to write timely and sensible awards. There's pressure to get it right, or at least not to be thought of an idiot as by the people or the losing party um, or both parties that read your award. There's pressure then if you have an award that... Uh, is challenged in court and wondering whether uh, it might be set aside or criticised even if not set aside. Those are real pressures and, and, and when you've done it for a while having some awards challenged is a bit of a rite of passage but it's not fun the first time it happens and we can't talk about the details of an arbitration in which we are an arbitrator but uh, all I would say is if you do have a colleague um, where you can talk generally about a particular situation or the way the parties are, are conducting themselves, uh, then you should do so. Being a sole arbitrator uh, is lonely. Uh, is, there is comfort in sharing thoughts with co-arbitrators, um, safety in numbers after you've, after you've made your decision. 
uh, but it's another area where you shouldn't be afraid to to speak up, speak to others. Uh, thanks. That's very wise advice, all of Lee. Um, Leanne, I know we've got some um, barristers uh, participating uh, in this session, and uh, as a barrister yourself, employed, what um, stresses does does that that bring, and and what are your strategies for managing those those pressures? Well, I'm sure there'll be others in addition to barristers who may be self-employed who'd, who'd share this. But I, I mean, I think it, it does bring in some specific stresses, in particular, the fact that if you're not working, you're not earning. Um, and that generates its own insecurity about a continued workflow. Um, you have a tendency to say yes to everything rather than no, which can sometimes lead to an unmanageable workload. Um, and there may also be a feeling that you're only as good as your last case. So you, 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 you put pressure on yourself to, to be perfect <laughs> um, and to try to win uh, every case. Um, and I think it, it, there's something about having your name <laughs> out there as opposed to being part of a firm. You, you know, you know that um, if, God forbid, you end up being sued, it's you who's being named. You know, if the lawyer is reporting on, on something that you've been involved in that's gone wrong, it will be your name. Now, I think that's happening more with solicitors and, and you know, law firms anyway now. But um, it, I think it creates a set of pressures. I think a lot of it is internal. I think this is about um, what Bill was talking about, about mindset. Um, because at least in theory, you should have more control over your workload. And I think it's realizing and, and making use of that, realizing you don't have to say yes to everything. You can regulate your workload. And having um, and, and, and challenging insecurities and having the confidence to say to yourself, um, you know, if you're in a quieter period, I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to use this to catch up on some of the things that I like doing that make life joyful rather than um, worrying about, hang on, they found me out. <laughs> where's, where's my next piece of work going to come from and scrambling around or, or just not enjoying that time um, when the work is, is a bit more cyclical. Um, I think you've got to try and create a support group um, of people you can talk to and you can trust and who are there for you so that you can, you know, get reassurance. That's normal, you know, that some of the pressures that you're dealing with are, are normal. Um, so those would be my suggestions, really. A lot of it's about challenging your own thinking um, and, and, and trying to live in the now rather than worrying about um, what's ahead. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, moving to the other end of the spectrum, many of us work in teams. In your experience, Anya, how does team structure and working patterns affect stress? It's interesting to listen to Leanne right, right now because I, I would say that many of the things that she mentioned would that she's mentioned would apply equally, sort of, in a team. So. Of course, um, being in a team can uh, add to stress a certain way because you have less control over your time. You have to fit in more requirements from different people. That might be difficult. Um, but uh, that, and, and I think therefore it's important to do exactly what Leanne was describing. So you have to regulate yourself. You have to uh, work out your boundaries. You have to, to, you have to set them. You have to communicate them and feel confident in doing that. One thing that I think is really important, which I think is quite difficult to do in our job, is ensure that you don't have anyone left alone. Um, you might work in a big team, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you feel you're supported. Uh, you have to really look that when, when you're not only staffing your teams, but you know, just in your general work culture, uh, people always feel like they have someone to talk to, to turn to about a problem. So it may be as a junior, you, you know, you have contact with, with other people at your level. And I think one of the biggest sources of, of, of stress could be removed if you really just have sufficient people on a case um, to ensure that no one really is bearing a burden entirely alone. So whether it is that you have um, a partner who's more involved in one aspect of the case, and that means the associate can go on holiday and let go for a bit. Um, so I think that that's something that's really important. It's difficult to do going to what Audley was saying. You know, we don't always have clients willing to 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 pay for, you know, the the 
the knowledge to be spread amongst several team members, um, and that can be a difficulty. But I do think that when we're when we're looking at setting up teams, um, focusing on really ensuring that no one person is completely alone in their sort of in in their task is is one of the key factors to reducing their own stress levels. Thanks, Anya. Um, Ali, what's your perspective um, of all of this as a team leader, leader managing stress in a team environment? Um, well, I think some of my, my colleagues may, 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 may find it slightly ironic that, that um, you're uh, asking me uh, how to best manage um, the team stress. Uh, I think that there is a related um, elephant in the room, although it's been touched on by Bill, and that's the fact that uh, we do work in a very high performance and pressurized environment, uh, especially around deadlines and hearings, but for most of the time. Uh, and junior lawyers are under the gaze of more senior associates, of partners, of clients, of the other side, uh, and possibly the tribunal as well. Uh, and that puts a huge amount of pressure uh, on everyone. Um, and I certainly recognize that working with partners or senior counsel can be intimidating, not particularly uh, easy to approach or to talk about these sorts of things. Um, and uh, the senior people, <laughs> perhaps closer peers, but senior people can be rude, um, often unpleasant, uh, very demanding especially when they are stressed themselves. Uh, and uh, a lack of respect for one's colleagues and for one's junior colleagues and an unhealthy culture uh, are key triggers to creating stress. Um, and what we've been discussing today is how we manage that with advice from Bill as to how we can do it. But there's one thing putting a bandage on a problem, um, we must be much more thoughtful of on, on issues of prevention so we don't let uh, that happen. So it's certainly not do as I do, but do as I say. Uh, and that is the responsibility of the team leaders, the partner, lead council, senior people to create that right culture and to create an environment where people can speak uh, about personal commitments or stresses they're having in their life, their own um, issues, or it may be uh, with children, it may be with uh, parents, uh, it may be other things in their in relationships. And not everyone will want to talk about that. And that, of course, must be respected. But there must be also a way where we create an environment where people can uh, say whether they are uh, not coping because some people will cope well and thrive in, in that sort of environment where another person will not because we are all made differently and we must create uh, that environment where people can um, speak out. You know, that, that's right. We all need to be doing our part to try and establish um, you know, that those, that culture. And you know, it's our hope that the things that we discussed today, this won't be a one-off, but that you'll be taking them back to your workplaces and your colleagues and, and continuing the conversation. Um, one thing that uh, uh, Dr. Mitchell talked about, um, yeah, and yeah, it, it sounds obvious, uh, you yeah, but there's a life outside of work, you know, life happens. Uh, we'll have lives and relationships outside of work and these can um, help us manage stress. They can also generate stress, um, whether it be health issues, relationship breakdown, caring responsibilities, bereavement, um, or family matters, and the list goes on. Um, and there's gonna be periods where we do undergo stress and that will inevitably impact uh, our lives at, at work. For, for me, it was the first six months after my son was born. It was a period of immense change uh, and many challenges 
uh, disruption to an ordinary routine and to uh, sleeping patterns. Um, so it requires an adjustment to, to work patterns and, and managing stress during these periods of change and transition you know, to, you know, to get to a new normal. Uh, I mean, Anya, what are your thoughts regarding um, you know, life outside work and, uh, and managing stress? Um, well, again, I think a lot of it has already been said. Um, I think really it's uh, recognising your priorities and also your limitations. And those might not always be where you think. Um, I mean, I'm going to sort of share a personal experience as well. I had a very difficult um, family matter that occupied me for several months. And uh, first of all, it was taking up so much of my time that I, I then spoke about it at work and asked to go part time for a, for a period of time just to be able to deal with that. So. That was, you know, recognizing that my time simply was not sufficient to deal with it. And luckily that worked. And it was also then, you know, recognizing that I did need professional support somehow to help me deal with the things that were going on. And that maybe also be it, that that helped me then also see the, the limitations, you know, of, of what we can and can't do. So when we're talking about all of these different challenging things that can come in, I think it really is about... Um, well, I mean, everything that we've said before, communicating about it, uh, not feeling guilty, not feeling like there are these huge taboos around um, personal difficulties as well. And then also really working out where you can, where you can spend your energy um, and, and how it is best spent. Um, and I think, you know, it's very individual, of course, as to how that happens. Um, but what Audley was saying before as well, I think really resonates. Um, we really need to feel like we can speak about this type of thing at work. Uh, that might be difficult for some people, but it, essentially uh, there's no real way around it. If, if we are working in a high pressured environment with lots of demands on our time, um, there, then if something comes up that impacts on that, you need to, to be open about it. Can I, can I pick up on something you said there, Anya, and also Bill, you said as well, and this point about um, being honest with your colleagues and honest with yourself about when you know, you're entering periods of struggling, because I think as a senior, more senior lawyer, um, you've got a real um, opportunity to break down the stigma that has historically attached to um, well-being, mental health. I mean, you, you remember back when I, when I started out, if somebody got stressed, uh, they would leave the firm, they would go and take a lifestyle choice and go to a different firm, or they'd go traveling. Well, that person may have actually been on the edge of that curve that Bill talked about. Um, and that's a lost employee to that firm because they weren't captured before they reached that critical point where they just couldn't cope and couldn't move on. So, you know, if I reflect back on my career um, and uh, I can definitely say and I have said to my colleagues and I've said at other conferences that there have been periods, you know, dark periods where I've struggled to sleep, you know, I felt inexplicably anxious, tired, all some of those red flags, Bill, that you mentioned. Now, I've been very fortunate in being able to handle that, keep my job going. I haven't quite gone off that curve, but have there been times when I've been fractious with my family and, you know, experiencing all those symptoms? Absolutely, both junior and senior. And so, you know, I would say that in terms of that thing about sort of managing your life, managing your, your home life, you've got to engage in this and think about your lives and how you can change certain aspects of your lives and be bold in talking about it and being bold in taking decisive steps so that you can keep that balance. Um, sorry for the, 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 the sermon there, but, it, but I really believe that the stuff that Bill has written about is incredibly powerful. No, th th thanks, Ed. And just to go to the, the other panelists now for... Uh, that one piece of advice that you wish you'd known earlier regarding how to manage stress. So perhaps uh, uh, Leanne, uh, we can go to you. I think uh, my piece of advice would be, you cannot get to the end of your to-do list. <laughs> so don't try, <laughs> don't just keep working and doing more. Take the time to prioritize your well-being um, uh, because it's essential um, and it, it's just impossible to do otherwise. And, and Anya, what's your piece of advice? Um, well, it's a bit controversial, but mine is um, really, really go with the mantra. No, no one's going to die. No one, we're not doing, we're not performing open heart surgery. 
Um, whether or not you forgot to put a cross-reference in, in the submission is not going to cost the case. And really just try and take a step back from the things that you're doing and don't let the small things stress you. Uh, Ed, I know you've already given us some advice, but do you have a, a final tip as well? I'd say just one nugget. Look out for your colleagues. Have that conversation that um, Bill talked about. Ask the questions and you might be surprised. And, and Audley, what about you? What's your, uh, your final piece of advice that you wish, wish you'd known? Earlier? Well, I think um, the, the takeaway from this uh, webinar, uh, and I'm so grateful for my colleagues and for Bill to uh, engaged in this, I think the takeaway for me would be that the, there should be no embarrassment. There should be no stigma attached to these issues so speak up if you're not feeling mentally well find an appropriate person and speak up thank you so much um, we're very grateful for this very fruitful talk i'm sure everyone will keep on the conversation going in other forum i must apologize to the audience because we've been receiving so many questions that we haven't been able to take. Uh, they're all very interesting and maybe we'll organize further conferences on the issue where we'll handle all of them. But thank you very much to Bill Mitchell. Thank you to our panelists for their time. Thanks to WIAG for the support. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again in other venues. We'll switch off now. Thanks again. Bye-bye. <laughs>